we were. Uh, are there any questions for any commissioners about any items on the agenda or any additional items that anyone would like to add to the agenda? All right, great. Well, the first item up is uh, the tobacco ordinance proposal, proposed amendments and authorization of study training in study blevins. It's going to help us out with this item. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I actually bring this um, matter before you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Board. Um, on their November 22nd meeting, they voted 16-0 uh, to 0 to bring two recommendations to the Commissioners for consideration uh, regarding vaping. And uh, you have some information there in the first paragraph of the letter just about some of the serious health concerns we're seeing around vaping. Uh, not just in North Carolina, but nationwide. We're seeing a rash of deaths, and uh, we've certainly seen folks hospitalized that mission with serious complications related to vaping and over this last year. And um, also we're seeing a tremendous rise in our school age population, kind of quite an issue there. And so really the recommendations are twofold. One is that we include vaping uh, in our county ordinances around the places that we can and cannot smoke, so that we consider that a form of nicotine use and don't allow vaping where we don't allow smoking. Uh, also, that we change the personnel ordinance so that this also applies to staff. So right now, if a staff member wanted to vape in a county vehicle, they could. There really wouldn't be anything in our ordinance that would say that was not allowed. Um, and then the second recommendation really from the uh, Health and Human Services Board is just to maybe do a longer term, you know, more in-depth study of what should our county's tobacco use policies look at. I think it's been a while since we've really looked at those ordinances. Uh, a lot of counties have continued to do a tremendous amount of work on this issue. And while they're not really bringing forth any recommendations, they just said to look at things like all types of tobacco to be included in the ordinances. Should the scope be expanded to places like greenways and other public spaces like that? Uh, signage, we do have the right signage, uh, you know, it's, it's a little old as well. And so if the commission were to uh, you know, act on either one of those, certainly our department will be more than willing to step up and be a resource to the commission. If we do something like this, do we have any, uh, uh, what do we provide you know, for people that are vaping or smoking or whatever to be able to get off of that? Do we provide anything as a service or? We really don't. That's a really good question. I certainly wouldn't put myself out there as the vaping expert. I mean, it is a legal, I mean, it's a legal substance, just like cigarettes are a legal substance. It's just that. You know, when vaping first came out, it was actually seen as possibly a way to help you come off of cigarettes. And if you read the CDC website, they still suggest there's a small segment of the population where vaping might actually might be a help to them. So if you're doing it correctly and as prescribed, it might be better for you than smoking a whole lot of cigarettes. What we're seeing is folks are vaping things that probably should not be going into their body. Uh, that's where we're seeing, I think, a lot of these deaths. Certain chemicals are getting in their bodies. Uh, people are beginning to vape CBD oil. We see uh, for a while we thought that was the culprit for a while of the hospitalizations because <coughs> it was showing that in some of the toxicology. Um, so really, I think like for years, you know, you know, I grew up in North Carolina. Everybody smoked when I was a kid. Nobody knew it would hurt you when I was a little kid. And I think the more we learn, we realize that, you know, it will just hurt you, it will kill you, and then secondhand smoke is dangerous. And I think we're just getting to the point where the research is really coming out. Uh, you know, maybe. And so <clears throat> just really bring this forward really as a matter of the, of the public's, you know, for the public safety. Well, I appreciate this being looked at. I'm mean, certainly supportive of you know reviewing the policy and, and um, I think the county's traditionally try to be a leader in this area. I think we should continue to try to do that. So I'm certainly supportive of looking at all the options. Thank you. 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 Thank
Mr. Belcher, I should say too, we do work with uh, Tobacco Free, the Injury Prevention Branch of North Carolina, and they would offer some resources if a person really did want to help with that. But as far as our HHS, we don't offer any type of services. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up, uh, we've got Josh O'Connor, who's going to give us an update on the Greenway Master Plan and the Woodfin Project. Brownie, it's hard to hear back here on both of you, speaker and you all, it's hard to hear. All right, thanks, Jerry. All right, we'll go ahead and start the presentation. You all may have to remind me that I'm clicking on the wrong one as I go through mine so I can see where we're at. So this is just to bring you up to date um, on our Greenway projects overall and to um, also bring you um, up to date with some specificity on the Woodfin project. Uh, first we're going to talk about the Greenway Master Plan. We're going to go through what, what it takes to go from conception to construction, uh, look at what areas we're prioritizing um, and where our focus is from a geographical perspective, and then look at the project probability and status review, so basically where we're at with each project. After that, we'll transition from um, an overall concept, conceptual review to the Woodfin Greenway project status update, uh, looking at the Woodfin High, Highway 251 Greenway, as well as the Beaver Dam Creek Greenway. So our Greenway Master Plan, which was adopted in 2012, uh, includes 102 miles of collective Greenway corridors. Um, when it was adopted, it included no dedicated funding, um, and it seeks a variety of funding from uh, whatever sources we can get money from, essentially. Uh, to date, that has largely been Federal Highway Administration Surface Block Transportation um, Program, or Surface Block Transportation Grant Program. Um, and we've been able to construct 0.4 miles of greenway uh, to date. That's down south on Lake Julian. It's the connector between the Lake Julian Park and the Lake Julian Park connector. I think our biggest takeaway um, with greenways as we've developed the department, developed our approach, is that greenways take a lot longer than we originally anticipated, uh, both from an obtaining funding perspective, uh, a regulatory perspective, um, and just the immense amount of work that it takes um, to build a greenway. Uh, we start out with the master plan, that's where we started prior to 2012. Uh, from that master plan, uh, we transition into what is called a feasibility study. Those feasibility studies give us a very high level of conceptual view of whether a particular greenway segment can work, um, and it starts to filter out some of the high-level cost. Um, it's not an effective tool for making cost estimation, but it's an effective tool for us to make decisions um, as to whether or not we're going to go further in the greenway design. Um, once we make that decision, we go into prelim preliminary design and engineering uh, for the project. Uh, that process can take one to two years plus, um, and that allows us to have a finite path to the greenway, understand uh, where the greenway is going to go, what property owners are going to involve, and what our regulatory issues are. Um, from that, we can go into land acquisition. Uh, land acquisition is simply acquiring all the easements and the property we need to construct the greenway, uh, making sure that we have a clear path alignment. Uh, one thing to note there is that under uh, the original adoption of the Greenway Master Plan, one thing that we are restricted from using is the power combination to build a greenway segment. So uh, acquisition for us is an important step, and there are often times when we may have to go back to design and redesign a segment of the greenway uh, if we're not able to acquire a property um, voluntarily from the property owner. Uh, once we go from acquisition, we move to construction. Again, that process can take anywhere from a year to two years, depending on the length of the greenway that we're looking at. Um, but then we can actually walk on the greenway. Uh, one thing that I tried to let the advocacy groups understand about greenways is even if someone were to give us a million dollars, two million dollars for cash, uh, it would still take that five to up to ten years to actually construct the greenway because of all the steps that we need to go through to do it. Uh, it gets even more cumbersome if we're using money that comes from the federal government or the state government because that just continues to add the to the regulations that we have to meet in order to go to construction. As we've laid out our approach to greenways, 102 miles is a lot of greenway to cover. Um, very financially expensive and not altogether economically feasible uh, with our, we're trying to bite off so much at once. So we focused our greenway effort on the I-26 and French Broad corridor. Um, the largest reason for that is that gave us projects to focus on that would prioritize very well 
um, during grant uh, funding cycles. And it also allowed us to align with the efforts of other municipalities. So uh, by choosing the I-26 corridor, we were basically able to take our Greenway efforts and go from the north and south of, of the city of Asheville and connect them to all their work on Greenways, uh, which creates a, a longer um, contiguous stretch of Greenway for our citizens to enjoy once it's fully realized. And this is an overall map of Greenway um, projects that we have engaged um, at some point from the Greenway's master plan. In order to make it onto this map, uh, the, the project had to be uh, at least studied at a feasibility level. So these are the projects that have been through that process. And I'm going to break it down a little bit more to explain um, where we are at each of those projects and um, what our probability for completion is. But first, I wanted to go through and explain how we assess probability of completion uh, and how we arrived at those conclusions. Uh, so something that's got a high probability, a probability of completion, uh, typically we have the funding source for the next phase identified. Um, it will make significant advances in our Greenway system from an activity standpoint, uh, and we may be facing um, having to send some grant funds back um, because of prior agreements we've made. Uh, medium probability of completion, um, that means that we think we know where to get the funding from. Um, construction would interface with our larger Greenway network, and we anticipate having to send funds back to a granting institution within five years. Low is that we've got no funding and sources identified, our construction costs exceed um, our current budgetary capacity, and um, we don't have any pressure to have to send any funds back in the, in the near future. So these are our high probability um, of completion of greenways that we've got. Um, I will start with the Inca Heritage Trail, um, since we're going to spend more time on the other uh, segments. But the Inca Heritage Trail, uh, it's about a two-mile section out in Inca. It's part of the Inca Recreation Destination. It'll connect our work at the Buncombe County Sports Park uh, to the ongoing work at the Bacchus Ball Fields. Um, we currently have the request for qualifications and letter of interest issued for that uh, project. Um, and we've started receiving responses for it, and we expect to begin design in the first quarter of 2020 um, and um, have the, the engineer design by 2020. <coughs> Um, any questions there? So you're just doing a re the request for qualifications for engineering services? Correct. Not for construction services. So that'll be a separate process once the design is complete? Correct. What and we anticipate this being um, a somewhat quicker um, completion timeline than we normally encounter because we're not dealing with a large number of landowners. We already have um, a pretty good understanding of the lay of the land and, and, and more in-depth feasibility study than we typically have, as well as some immediate intermediary engineering. Um, the biggest constraint that we're going to hit with Inca Heritage Trail is making sure that we've satisfied all the federal agencies and the requirements they have for uh, core engineers and FEMA. And we do also have some cultural resources in the area that we're going to have to uh, take into account as well. But all of the right of ways in place for the project proceed. As far as we understand now, that was an agreement um, as part of our approach to the Inca Recreation Destination and our partnership with Bob Lewis Ball Fields. All that's been executed. Uh, we need to do some further work on the west half of that trail. Remember, we did it approximately from uh, behind the school to about the bridge. We needed to get some more players at the table for the bridge over to near comes out near the angle side of that property to complete that one. <clears throat> so the um, all this all of the land under the uh, the um, Martin Lewis partnership that's all in place so, but then beyond that there might be additional um, there's some additional players uh, to bring to the table on that we don't anticipate a huge problem with that but we need to make sure we get Army Corps approvals to put the Greenway on top of that berm and to work with Dominion Gas to make sure that we have Greenway on top of where they're putting that underground. So the landowner, the landowner agreements are in place, but there's some permitting stuff that will need to be gone through. A little bit of both on the west half. And part of that is just looking for that level of specificity um, in terms of what the actual layout will be of the Greenway. We have it from a conceptual standpoint, um, but that's just putting a line on an aerial photograph. Um, we're going to be narrowing that down to where we can locate exactly where it's going to go within a 30-foot easement and what our additional construction needs are. 
um, at that time. We are looking to capture some synergies with um, some utility upgrades um, in that area, and that will also influence some of our decision making, um, which is a reason that we don't have it fully specified with land and owner agreements in some of those areas. Okay, so my understanding is this was pretty much ready to go. And so they had all the agreements were signed. I'm not talking about federal, I'm talking about everything's done. Everything's done and then we're, you know, we got our grants and we're going to put the foot on the gas. And to me this looked like an easy one to get done. I'm not, I'm not hearing that. No, I think this one is an easy one to get done, and it's just the stage that we usually assign agreements at or further along in design so that we know that we're not going to go back and sign agreements a second time. So when would construction start? Uh, we would be looking at 2021. And we've um, this project, we've been waiting for DOT to release the funding um, in order to start design, and that's been one of our major holdups. The funding became available for the project in October, um, but due to some funding slowdowns in NCDOT, we're not able to access the funding until next year. So what can we do to speed it up? Um, I think speeding it up is going to come in how effectively we deal with the, the design and construction um, process when we have communicated with firms about how we're going to handle uh, requests for qualifications. We left it relatively open-ended in terms of our scheduling and have let them know that we expect this to be um, an expedited schedule um, compared to what we would normally see on some of our greenway projects. And this still has us um, right now meeting our anticipated timelines for construction for our TDA grants. Yeah, let's keep doing um, we've got the Beaver Dam Creek Greenway um, at the, the northern side of the map. Um, we've got engineering and design set to commence on that project in 2020. Uh, and I won't spend much time on that because we'll go into more detail as we move through the presentation. Uh, the same with the Riverside Greenway, Riverside Drive Greenway. We have design underway. Uh, we've completed 30% of the design and we're going to get into um, some of the issues that have held design back there uh, further in this pre presentation. And then we have the rad tip connector, which we spoke about at your last pre-meeting, and I believe it's on the agenda for tonight. Uh, and that's a project that will be transferred to the city of Asheville, but that's our connection into the city of Asheville's work through the River Arts District Transportation Improvement Project. So moving into our um, greenways with um, medium uh, probability of completion, we have the 191 corridor and the Big Creek Lake Julian uh, Greenway. We partnered with North Carolina DOT as they were assessing uh, the expansion of I-26 through this area. Um, and we're able to get them to foot the bill for the feasibility studies along this corridor. Uh, we've got these projects entered in North Carolina Department of Transportation State Transportation Improvement Project. Um, so they're there waiting for funding. Um, but it is a pretty intensive uh, construction corridor with about 13 plus miles of greenway to go to construction. Um, so this is one where We've identified the basic needs uh, on the master plan level, and we know where we need to go with the Greenway. Um, it's just we need to uh, find some funding, commit to funding, um, and move it forward. But it's sitting there on the back burner until we can advance some of our other high probability projects forward. So any questions there? And we've got two um, low probability Greenways. Uh, one is the Reams Creek Greenway. Uh, we've actually advanced that to engineering and design. We're working on getting an RFQ issued. The reason that we have it as a low probability of construction is we do not have any funding identified for it. Um, it's largely within the town limits of Newberville. So we'd be looking for um, some new funding partnerships to bring that greenway to construction. Uh, we are advancing it to design, so we'll have uh, further information about in cost. Uh, and we do have Federal Highway Surface Transportation Block Grant programs available um, to help us with that. But again, we don't have information or funding identified for construction yet. And what's this site control um, for the right of way look like for this project? Is there are there a lot of different property owners who would still need to agree to work on the project, or are most of the property owners or all of them conceptually in support of doing this? 
we've not started engagement. We have to be careful with how we engage property owners um, because of some of the federal regulations out there. We, when we engage design, we will go to property owners that we feel like will be impacted and ask them to sign a letter of commitment. But at the end of the day, if we use federal funds, we also have to show that the, the landowner knew that they could achieve fair market value for the easement or the property. And so we typically wait to execute. Um, so, okay, so understanding that process on this project is that uh, is the um, right of way for the easement seen as you know likely to be uh, fairly doable or quite a challenge. I mean, I guess the reason I ask is that for these uh, a lot of these projects where you've got a lot of different landowners who need to all agree, and maybe there's some workarounds if someone doesn't. I mean, to me, it just seems like a huge potential barrier for some of the projects. And so I'm just kind of wondering, is that viewed as probably not a big challenge on this one, or it could be could be a significant challenge if there was you know funding to actually go go forward? I put it in moderate. You're not dealing moderate. with okay. a lot of property owners. There are some larger parcels in there. Okay. Um, probably less than moderate. I mean, okay. um, you're also building right next to the creek, which is going to have a lot of undevelopable or undesirable property. So in context like that, it's a little bit easier to navigate the easements um, and right away. Um, we do have some room in the project to move the alignment if we need to. Um, we're not as constrained on other projects. So this one's not going to be as hemmed in as some of the projects that are like the Woodfront project um, that have other constraints that are feeding into it. And then the, the US 70 Greenway, um, this actually overlaps with the Fonta Flora Trail, the commission approved to um, overlap our greenway system with the Fonta Flora State Trail several years ago. Um, it's an effort that we're pursuing, but it's also a pretty expensive effort given how much land that we're looking at um, in Buncombe County for that trail to tra traverse. We're looking at about 16 miles of trail uh, if we follow the current alignment. So it's there, we're looking for funding. Uh, we're also looking at how we can break that greenway down further into more digestible chunks. Um, but given the uh, scope of that greenway and the um, the magnitude of that greenway, it's, it's not risen to a high priority. So now I'm going to bring it back around with a little bit of information about the Woodfin Project and its current status. So the Woodfin Greenway um, collectively is five miles of greenway. Um, it's currently programmed in two projects, one for the Beaver Dam Creek Greenway and one for the Riverside Drive slash 251 Greenway. Um, each segment was part of our Greenway Master Plan in 2012. It was also part of Woodfin's Greenway Master Plan in 2011. Um, I've got some more detailed information on that Riverside Drive Greenway. Uh, it's a three mile um, corridor. I anticipate the cost of construction to now be around $2.5 million a mile. Um, that's what our current regional average uh, is, is going for. Um, we anticipate it to be through with design already, but this project is kind of um, drug out due to some regulatory issues and trying to secure some of the, the easements and right away, uh, which we have moved forward with. Um, but we did encounter some constraints that, that delayed that project more heavily than we anticipated. Uh, we currently have a grant funding total for this project of 3.66 million, 3 million uh, is for the construction of the Greenway, uh, 660000 is for the design, and I'll break those figures down a little bit, um, as there are some figures uh, that involve county matches as well. Um, we do have some ter terrain difficulties as we go through there. I think we've identified um, over 150 plus um, stream outfalls where we have pipes going um, across the embankment out into the, the stream, so that's something that we're going to have to mitigate as we're constructing the Greenway, um, find out what those sources are, um, and we also um, are pinched in between the river, a railway, and a roadway, and um, in places that gets pretty challenging in terms of where we're going to put the greenway. Um, this funding is a collective project between the town of Woodfin, Buncombe County, and we've received funding for the TA that I'll break down in just a second. So, any questions on the overview there? Uh, the Beaver Dam Creek Greenway is another two mile segment. This goes from MSD's administrative facility. Um, and follows the Beaver Dam Creek. Uh, it comes out near the train depot for Craggy Mountain Rail Line uh, near Merriman Avenue. Um, we also anticipate the cost of construction for this greenway to be around 2.25 um, a mile. Uh, we've secured, right now we have $2 million for construction secure. We also have some additional funding 
um, for design that we anticipate receiving. That, that figure is about 220000 for the design. You said Beaver Dam, you're estimating the cost as $2 million a mile per building agreement? 2.5. And that's, um, that's based on looking at projects and cost overruns um, around the region. Um, originally, years ago when we started, we were told a million dollars a mile and pretty much every Greenway project that every municipality has encountered has doubled up that project cost, if not more. Are you estimating that for the um, project in, um, in the uh, Candler project as well? Yes. Um, that one's fortunate because we are dealing with um, fewer landowners and may be able to capture some of those synergies with utilities um, where we can go straight over the top of existing utility right of ways and that's not something that we have available in some of these other projects. If we can do that, it dramatically decreases our cost of design and construction because we're dealing with a more level pad that we can start from. It just, you know, I mean it just intuitively seems like project through um, but you're, just, you're saying that's the average we're just assuming for every mile. It's not specific. I mean, um, just intuitively, like building a project through that kind of urbanized type footprint in Woodfin along the river. I mean, I can just see how that would be really complicated uh, for a bunch of different reasons. But these um, projects like this one that are kind of more out in the country, I don't know, it just seems like they would, I can see how the cost would vary widely, you know, widely between different projects. Is that how you anticipate it'll play out? Or, I mean, some might be quite a bit less, some might be. Quite a bit more, just depending on exactly what you have to you know, engineer. Yeah, and one of the historic problems with building greenways in this area is, is underestimating what's underground. Um, that's that's always been an issue. As once you start digging, um, you might find old cars, um, any amount of landfills, and we are running through some of that stuff with Beaver Dam Creek, where we anticipate we're going to hit some segments of that. Um, we also have a rail line that runs parallel to the greenway. We're running next to a creek, and we're running. Um, pre-adjacent to some old landfill area, so um, we don't want to back down those costs too much because we may be dealing with some brownfield remediation. Right there. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering, um, does it make, it may not even be doable, um, I mean, does it make sense to concentrate our efforts on the releases to achieve? and just throw everything at it to get it done quicker? Um, or, I mean, so I mean, I look at the whole plan and it's, you know, four tenths of a mile has been done since it was adopted in 2012. And so, it's obviously taken a lot longer than people think, right? Well, we have to remember that we didn't dedicate any funding until 2015. So that significantly delayed our construction timelines and then once we began to get funding, um, we started out, I want to say, in the hundreds, like small hundreds of thousands. That allowed us to start pursuing grants, but a lot of those grants, when we, we pursued them, were about two years out. So we're basically still caught in that original lag time. Um, dumping all the efforts in one Greenway project is not necessarily going to speed us up because one of the things that slows us down is the number of coordinating entities. Like any time we move money for this project, any time we um, hire for this project, it's got to get approved by state and federal agencies, and so that, that significantly slows us down. Um, if we were to look at using non-restricted funding sources, we could dramatically speed up the, the cost of greenway construction, but that'd be, we'd be coming out of pocket 100% of the cost. Once you federalize a project and apply federal dollars, you completely change the regulatory landscape. Um, Has that been seriously considered in any of these projects? Especially the ones where, you know, just looking at the topography and the land might be relatively inexpensive to build some of these if you can just go, just go do it. There are some conversations occurring with that. Um, a lot of it is more linked into um, what conversations can we have with developers during the developer development approval process. Can we create some of those Greenway linkages that way and require Greenway dedication as part of large um, development construction projects? And at that point, that's, that's one mechanism to um, find some funding there. Um, to date, I've not seen anybody that's like a local municipality that's willing to pull a bunch of money um, out of pocket, and then we do chance running into issues with ADA compliance or further compliance should we decide to upgrade one of these facilities in the future with federal money. It's a strategy. It's just not something that I've seen anybody willing to jump out there and do together.
So this is the collective um, map of this greenway um, in a little bit more detail. The brown segment to the north is the Beaver Dam Creek Greenway that's running east to west, and then that transfers to uh, the Woodrum Greenway that runs parallel to the river and Riverside Drive. The reason this is why we use federal funding is we started out with a $1.13 million local funding commitment um, for both design and construction. Uh, we partnered with FHWA uh, that brought in $4.53 million uh, for a total of $5.66 million on the total project. And that's not including TDA funds or the, uh, the, the funding for the other components, the Woodfin project. Is that for all the green ones or one? That's for one. That's for the Woodfin green one. I'm sorry, maybe Mr. Finn is general. I think you said there's 3.6 million in funds for this project. The 3.6 million is for Riverside Drive. The other 2 million is for the Beaver Dam Creek. So collectively for the two greenways, which are all part of the same project, there's 5 point. Okay, 5.6 is for Beaver Dam and alongside the river. Yes. Between the county and the FHWA, but that doesn't count the town of Woodfin and it doesn't count the TDA. Correct. So there's actually like a, when you add it all up, there's a, there's a lot of money for this project, right? Uh, I think we, it's around 12. And I've just got some um, shots of some of the stuff that we're trying to work with in the area. Um, this is the mill at Riverside Studio. Um, one of the issues that we have there is you can see how far the pavement extends uh, toward the riverbank. Uh, they've been exceptional to work with, but it's not just a typical greenway design. We're having to figure out how to integrate current parking areas, um, retaining walls out there at MSD's um, equipment storage yard, um, and other issues in order to get the greenway through there. Um, it's, it's more complex than just asking the landowner to give us a footprint for the greenway. In some areas, we're having to go through and ask them, can they move fences and retaining wall structures uh, and any number of things on their property in order to accommodate the greenway. Um, so that's lengthen the, the time, amount of time that's taken for design um, and cause some issues with our cost overall. Um, this is another issue that we ran into um, on the back side of Salon Plastics. Um, we have a Duke transmission line that typically they won't allow us to be within 30 feet of their poles. Um, when we examined that, uh, we originally looked at some cantilevering structures uh, that would go out over the French Broad River um, in order to get us out of the, the Duke um, right away. And after looking at the cost, assessing the cost, we were able to go back with Duke and ask them for some exceptions, um, which they've been willing to work with us on to, to be able to put the, the greenways closer to those poles. Um, it's not without, it's some additional design costs and some fencing structures and some other things that we have to do. Um, but working through solutions like this have dramatically increased our design cost, um, hopefully in, um, allowing us to reduce our construction costs in the long run. Um, this is an, an option that once we were able to navigate this, took a significant amount of time, um, but also saved us a couple million dollars from not having to cantilever a greenway design over the French Broad, uh, and has a better um, environmental and ecological impact as well. So Duke has, has Duke has formally agreed to let us use a, have a right of way underneath the, with already the, the utility transmission line easement? Formally, not on paper, but formally they committed to that. Um, in the last on-site meeting that we had with town representatives and Duke representatives. It's just a, it's kind of a verbal agreement at this point. Correct. It's and it's all, um, it's a, a three-way agreement with Silverline Plastics as well because they've got to make some concessions <coughs> for, uh, where they're allowing us to site that agreement. And these are the other uh, design considerations. There's uh, how close we are to the rail line, the power line, the road, um, and the train line. Fortunately, Craggy Mountain Rail Line is not a conventional rail line. It's one that's privately owned. We may have been able to work with them um, to get us closer than we would typically be to a rail line um, because we've got a lot more certainty on what's going to be operating on that rail line and how often. Um, but there are spots without those agreements that we wouldn't be able to, to get the greenway through without having to re do some road realignments. And the, the blue lines that you can see there just show um, the amount of property that's impacted by both FEMA floodplain and FEMA floodway. Um, one of the things that drives costs on a project like this is since we can't just move the project out of the floodway, we're going to do no rise studies and additional engineering studies to show that the screenway is not going to have um, an impact on Asheville's overall flooding. And that's just a more 
in-depth view of the connection between Woodfin uh, taking us through uh, Montford down into the River Arts District. So our status with the Woodfin project right now, uh, the design for the River Side Drive uh, Woodfin Greenway is at 30%. Um, the project is part of a larger destination project similar to what we organized with the incorrect Re recreation destination. It includes Silver Line Park, which is currently under design, uh, the Woodfin Wave, which is a um, structure across the entire French Broad River to create um, some water sports tourism, um, and the Woodfin Wave Park, which will be the amenities uh, to support that wave structure. Um, we are the lead agency working with several partners. We uh, take on the Greenway design and construction, uh, and we're also collaborating with Federal Highway Administration, the Town of Woodfin, and the Tourism and Development Authority to get the project done. Uh, the initial cost estimates, if I can flip it off, I apologize, um, came in um, when uh, at a million dollars per mile. Um, the feasibility study that we originally engaged for this project actually put construction at in the hundreds of thousands of mile. Of mile. Um, when we went to construction and started doing our initial investigation of grants, um, we based that on regional fit figures um, and elevated that significantly to a million dollars a mile. Um, but at that point, there still was not a lot of regional context in terms of greenway construction. It was after we saw New Belgium constructed and some of the other projects hit significant cost overruns so that we went back and adjusted our figures um, a second time. The current greenway um, costs have escalated up to that $2.5 million a mile. Right now, that's based on our regional figures. Um, and our engineering and design efforts um, have been complicated by the regulatory requirements. Um, we're dealing with some pretty poor land quality in that area. Uh, there are areas that we found um, that we're going to have to remove soils, augment soils, remove uh, debris, um, and do a lot of ground preparation work that we did not originally anticipate. Um, we have some issues with land owner preferences, as so we all raised. We've got some issues where we could be out back next to the river. Um, the landowner doesn't support that, and so we're going to have to take that section of the way um, out in front of the building. Um, unless that landowner changes their mind. Um, it's taken longer than anticipated for the utility coordination, um, even in coordinating with the railroad, uh, just to get a permit to cross the railroad. A lot of times we're looking at a three to four month approval period. Um, and that's not with construction, that's to get our people across the, the railroad. Um, we've got historical and environmental uh, damage and degradation. Um, we've encountered pretty much everything we could along that section of Greenway. That's not something we didn't anticipate. Um, it's just given us a lot to work with in terms of how we accommodate um, those issues for design. And then we have the transportation constraints with the road being so close to the river there. Um, our ability, ability to advance the project construction is somewhat limited uh, because of some capital flows that we have with the project. I'm going to break those down for you. <coughs> so um, in breaking that $3.6 million down further, our initial design grant for the Greenway was $660,000 um, for the Riverside Drive portion of the Greenway. Um, I think there's been a conception that that was our budget for the project, and the reality was the $660,000 was how much that we could get from FHWA when we made the application um, and maxing that application out. Um, our current cost estimate from the engineer placing places our cost at $1.62 million. Um, and that's the additional capital we need to advance that design toward completion. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a variety of funding sources uh, contained within the project. Um, we've got the Woodfin bond coming in at $4.5 million. We've got TDA coming in with a $2.25 million contribution. FHWA is coming in at $5.1. And Buckingham County's commitment at this point is $1.132 million. Um, in order to satisfy all the granting regulate our granting entities uh, as the conclusion of this project, we are obligated to produce both the Greenway, Silver Line Park, Riverside Park, and the Woodfin White Water Wave. Um, so did you say that you were required to do the Beaver Dam project as well? Yes, the, the Greenways collectively, that's that's what's listed in our TDA application. Okay. So, so it's just the TDA requirement, that's the only place that's required. Let me look at that slide for just a second. Th 
that's our only requirement. I believe it was listed in the Whitman bond, but that's not a requirement that extends to us. On the bond referendum, that was listed as a project? Or the, the Greenway that were listed as part of the bond referendum, but that's not something that... That's not like legal obligations. Correct. Say. It was kind of identified as all the projects they hope to get done as part of their local funding. Correct, and we are a third party to that, so it's not an obligation that we are obligated for. So it's not a TDA requirement, it's a bond requirement. It is a TDA requirement. It is a TDA It is a TDA Because all of those was lumped together in one ask from the TDA. Correct, and in order to get TDA approval, they want to see more of a destination concept, and so all of those components were listed as deliverables for the TDA grant. So the Woodfin Project costs, I've got it broken down for the Riverside Greenway, um, our original design money was $132,000. Um, county commitment that got us $528,000. Federal money for a total of $660,000. Design. Our current estimated design cost sits at $1.617 million. So we've got a major deviation there. Our current construction um, obligation in terms of Buncombe County's pay-in is $600,000 and we'll get $2.4 million from the FHWA for a total of a $3 million uh, construction budget, um, which is clearly less than the $2.5 million in miles that we need. Um, our estimated construction cost at this point exceeds um, $6 million. Um, for Beaver Dam Creek Greenway, we currently don't have any design money invested from Buncombe County. Uh, we do have $220,000 pending from the FHWA for design of that greenway. Um, $400,000 uh, for county commitment to construction and $1.6 million for FHWA's commitment to construction for a total of $2 million construction. And these numbers are laid back out. Um, the one I want to focus on is in terms of consideration for action and next steps is that we look at um, in order to advance this project forward, currently we're kind of stuck until we have um, some additional capital outlined to continue doing construction. Um, as of right now, we've spent $141,000 of our $632,000 or $660,000 um, in that design. Um, but in order to advance the design to completion um, and to be guaranteed that we're going to get to completion, we need that $950. $58,000 deficit. Um, right now, we're stuck between continuing to advance the design and running out once we've got the money, um, or we've spent through the money that we have on hand. Um, but what we request is that we reallocate some of those um, the funding for future construction to get us through design and look at um, an additional obligation um, in the next budget year to supplement this project. You're referring just to the quarter along the river? Yes. So, and what would the additional amount be in, this, the, in the next budget that would be requested? It's going to be 958000 okay. right. But doing it that way allows us to continue work on the project now and continue advancing it toward design instead of having to wait until the budget year. So, you know, I'm definitely in favor. I mean, this is a this is a I mean, this is a complex project. You know, I mean, slowing down there and you know, like versus standpoint, it's it's a tight footprint. There's all these different things going on down there. It's a busy busy area. But I think I mean, I think the Woodfin, the, the especially the corridor along the river, this will be one of the best projects we have. Uh, it'll be so heavily utilized. Um, I'm definitely in favor of doing what we can to continue the design process on it, um, and, you know, including shifting some money from, dis from construction to design on this project. But I guess I would also just um, kind of raise the question. I mean, I, I like the idea that we're planning some other things that are further out, but just in thinking about this, I mean, I think there's also just just to get some of these done, right? Yeah, so if there's, if there's funding allocated for other to me, this is, you know, the project in Inca, which I think is going to be on a faster track, hopefully, nothing's easy, right? But it should be relatively easy, relatively easy. 
So, right. so hopefully that one comes in, maybe it comes in less, less costly than what's typical because of the topography. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would also be able to redirect some resources from other projects to just make sure this one is, this one's getting done. So, so I'm kind of a, a, a similar way. I think you know, tonight we're gonna, we're gonna vote on something else that, you know, it's a million dollars more. You know, and that's, that's stuff we got to explain to everybody. It's not directed to you, it's just directed in general. I don't show much further. Um, but I also think that when, you know, when you're in a community and you hear all the good news about what's happened, and you get excited about it, kids get excited about it, and you don't want them to you know, grow up on you before it's done. You know, so instead of having this big monster plan that we're putting a little bit of money every, everywhere, it seems to me we should pick what we can get done and direct that, you know, that, that funding towards it. So I think I said the same thing you did. Yeah, I mean, these are all great corridors. I mean, just yeah. all happen, but I just, there is, um, and I hear you, some of these uh, decisions that are with other agencies, not us, all the way to the world, so to speak, is that. So I, I totally get that, but I would be supportive of. You know, focusing our resources in the ways that we can to help get our, you know, our top priority projects advanced as fast as they possibly can. I think so the biggest constraint there is that we're, when you look at Greenway investment, like off the cuff, we've got about $21 million in federal highway grants coming down. Um, it's a $4.2 million county commitment. So even reallocating those is not going to get us the capital funding that we need in order to advance the projects. We're using so much external funding. Um, compared to such a small proportion of county funding, and that just kind of extends how long it takes us to get access to the capital. Yeah, I, I hear that. I hear that our percentage is small relative to that, but also just, I mean, all these projects play out on the cost that you have. I mean, these other projects are not going to get done, right? Mm -hmm. For the very reasons you just explained, there's not enough money to do them in the foreseeable future. So I realize, like, our money is, is not the biggest driver in this, but it sounds like, you know, uh, we're going to need to put in more. We want to see some of them done realistically. So I'd be, and I'm open to that. I'm, I'm very supportive of these projects moving ahead. Yeah. It sounds like if we did do some redirecting, we'd have to talk to TDA about, like, hey, would you be open to some of your money coming over here so we can get this one done? Um, I bet that, I think they'd be open to that conversation because they will see things get done too. They understand some of these projects end up being more complicated and expensive than originally uh, when you first look at them. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I think I think we'd have to talk to some of the partners too about maybe we maybe able to that as well, uh, as well as maybe also just put, not only changing the funding but maybe putting in more more money too. I mean, so it's like all those conversations. I think it's something that we're looking at beyond Buncombe County at a regional level because we're not the first one to hit an issue yeah. like this with federal funding. Um, pretty much every Greenway project that I know of that's using these funding streams is hitting the same thing. So what can we do to build in opportunities for overages and higher potential? Well, the, I mean, the project's down on the, on the riverfront in Asheville, right, into a bunch of these cost overruns. But to their credit, to their credit, you know, they, they take a lot of heat for different things in the community. But to their credit, the TDA stepped in and just enabled $4 million more dollars. Here's $4 million more dollars because we want to see these projects happen. And I think these these projects we're working on and look at are, are, very, are very similar. I mean, every, everyone knows they're going to be great when they're done and they're, they're hard. So, so yeah, uh, you know, for me, shoot, you know, um, I vote for all of them. Uh, you know, how passionate I am about one and you know, I got a long history on that. I try to buy that thing every day, you know, and the Eagles is across the street from it. You know, so I run into people all the time asking about that. Can't hear you back here, Joe. I run into people all the time asking about that. And, uh, you know, once we get over the hurdle of voting to invest taxpayer dollars, um, I'd like to see us take a, a same draw, you know, drill down on the on the you know, really specifics on what we can do to just speed along. It's, it's part of the Buncombe County Sports Park, and I guess that's coming along, you know, pretty good. You know, the lights have went up out there. There's, there's some there's some things that you know that we're seeing out there, and uh, it'd be it'd be really good for us to be able to you know when somebody asks when something's going to happen to try to give a shot at giving the answer to that, even though it's very complicated. Um, what's the federal dollars on just the Greenway, the trail portion in Inca? 
Do you remember? If not, you can bring it back. It was six million. It's four point eight um, federal and one point eight, one point two. One point two from us. Yes. Four point eight from them. And then six federal, million. Six million from the TVA. Yes. So twelve so, million. Away. So the four point eight is uh, that includes the, the trail system. That includes that includes some sidewalk connectivity over there. It, it can. Um, our hope is to like to try to pay for it out of that four point eight. Okay. So I thought it was in the in the in the original design. Yes. So anyhow, whatever we can do to have a you know a gathering and accelerate some of this, you know, I would be very, I would be for. And I will ask Max to put the one slide just one bullet point that I think um, is on that last slide um, covers that. Um, just that last slide. In order to make sure that y'all understand where this is going and y'all maintain um, an understanding of where we're at with these greenway projects, they are complex, they do take a while to get through. Um, we're including greenway projects in the comprehensive um, CIP uh, for 2021, um, which will include uh, funding requests that you understand the complete design and construction costs as we know it at that time, and we'll have a better picture of that moving forward. Um, they, I know that they. We've been in town with us that they were you know, working on. I think we'll just answer that one. Yeah, I believe our total funding allocation for that one was four hundred thousand dollars over three years. Um, that project's moving forward. They hit um, two major issues. One was a railroad trestle that they were having to go under, and then the second was going under um, Highway Nine there. And I believe they've actually um, come back with some designs that are going to be much more advantageous than they originally pictured. But it's just back up and going. <coughs> federal and state approvals for that. Okay. But Black Mountain is the lead on design and implementation. We're just contributing some funds. Correct. It sounds, sounds like they're doing that. That's right. Correct. Awesome. All right. Commissioners, any other questions or feedback for, for now? Josh, anything else you want to hear with us or anything else? To... No, I'm sure I'll be back, but thank you all for your time today. Hey, appreciate you. Hey, appreciate everyone's work with us. All right. Um, next up is uh, Rachel Nygaard, who will be talking about the strategic partnership. I'm sorry. Next up is the Greenways Committee. Still on that. That's us. All right. So, commissioners, uh, as we talked about in our last meeting, we need to decide who we're going to interview. So, um, I think, you know, because there's a ton of applicants, 25 total. We interviewed all. We, we need to take probably a whole day to do it. Um, so it's still going to be pretty time consuming, but I'm hoping we can maybe, um, all right, but just to refresh our memory, how many positions we ultimately appoint? Nine. What are we for each district? Yeah. So we need, to, we need to select nine. I'm kind of hoping maybe we can interview, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, something like that. Um, so one, one suggestion would be that we can just kind of go around, each person nominate like one person, we'll see how many come down the first round. I think we'll have a lot of overlap is my hunch. And then we can go around again, everyone nominate your second person, see how many we have, and see if like, we'll start to feel good about our pool of applicants or other, other folks that people really, really want to have interviewed. So that was going to be my suggestion, to go down one at a time, nominate someone, and then do it again and see how many we have, and then we can do a third round if we don't have enough applicants or just others that we really want to talk to. Does that sound like a good process? Um, so maybe we get Commissioner Fryer to fill that out and put it in later. Yeah, we can, uh, we can ask him for his input as well. All right. Um, can we start on your side, Amanda, and just go down? Sure. Um, my first recommendation is Ann Babcock. Uh, 
because he's big on my interview. You've heard him do that. Probably butchered the name. Because I just wanted to ask the senior citizens. Okay. Well, the only reason I say you may not get free is that you say you're like, you know, anybody other people. So you might get your free, but just, oh. you know. All right. Uh, I would um, definitely supportive of, of Ann as well. But also, with her already being mentioned, I'll mention um, Lena Richards. Okay, uh, Jasmine. Uh, Susan Lee. Number three, Susan, yeah, maybe mention the person's number too, so we can kind of find out on here easily when we're going through the city. Uh, Robert, do you have a suggestion? Yes, uh, Teresa Lee. Let's, why don't we just kind of take another pass uh, this way. Um, Amanda? Number one, Dusty Allison. Amanda, you're picking. <laughs> All right. Dusty Allison. Great. Did I get two this time? You can have up to two, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Number 23, Derek, two. And. Uh, So far, um, uh, I'm going to suggest. Actually, I'm going to hold off for now. I'm going to see who else gets mentioned from our other commissioners. Uh, Eric, I'm just going to Turn your mics on up there. Uh, we're really loading up District 3 there. Have you noticed that? Uh, yeah, let's see how it should be made. Yeah, but 2 District 6, 2 8 uh, so That's a good question. Are the districts that are listed here, that's the current district configuration. Is that correct, Lamar? Not the uh, future elections map? I bet it is, because this is probably all created prior to the. Well, we mentioned the number one in response. I will actually defer to John. If Josh has that information, I don't want to give the incorrect answer to that. Josh, do you know, so the districts that are listed here where the folks reside, those are delineated by the districts that exist today, not the new districts that will go into effect in a subsequent election cycle. Is that right? These are the current district boundaries. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, just remember, remember, these are for interviews. When we get finished, we have to select nine, so we don't need to select nine today. No, no, we need a few more than nine. We need more than nine. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So um, we currently have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I, I, and I wonder, um, yeah, I wasn't keeping track of how many we have from each district while we're doing this. Um, if you'll we need a few more, so why don't we, I'm just going to go again, yeah, and if people haven't, you know, some other people. We need one more pass. That is, are we are we clearly de deficient in a certain district where we need to be? No, no, read the names off. I'll give you the district. Okay, let's see. Um, Ann Babcock two. is two. Jennifer three. is three. Lena Richards three. Susan Bean one. one. Teresa Williams three. three. Dusty Allison, one. Derek Turno, one. Shay Brown, one. one. Kelly Sparks, three. Actually, Eric Ernst. Kelly Sparks, actually, Kelly was actually two. I have like six from District Three. 
No, wait, wait, wait. Kelly Sparks is three. She's three. According to this chart. Really? They get two. I know that she's in District 3. She's three. Yeah, I'm not counting the votes. I'm counting which district they're in. Sorry, I'm not district. Uh, Eric Ernst is in District Three, so actually it's District Two. District Two is that um, we need definitely at least two more people to even the minimum. So um, we've got a bunch from one and three. So um, does anybody have? I'll start with Amanda, but we'll go down. And if you don't want to nominate someone, you can take a pass uh, and reserve the right to bring it back later. Um, is there someone from District? Two, yes. Amanda. Uh, Stuart Cowles. I don't know if I'm saying his last name correctly. I'm sorry. Stuart, Stuart Cowles, um, number eight. Okay. That's and, a lot of okay. Um, so you said you. Al or Joe, do y'all have another number two? Well, I had. I had Go check this out of Stuart Cowles. Yeah, I am too. Um, let me check one, I'll tell you this. Let me check 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about Philip Cole from District 2? He's uh, number seven. No, it says Fletcher. Is he in, is he, well, it says District 2, though. Is he in the Buncombe County? He's not in the District 2. Well, there is a section of Fletcher in the, in the current old District 2. Okay. So, Lamar, he is uh, a resident of Buncombe County. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coles? Philip Coe. Coe. Mm -hmm. What is the Lantern Resources? <laughs> We're all about <laughs> what is labor resources. Hey, Josh. Hey, um, I also would just ask, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but are there are there any other nominees that the staff would just want to make sure at least like get interviewed on this list of applicants? And you can think about that for a minute if, if you would like to. But if there's, I think we're kind of getting near this near the list, but we do need a few more. If there's anybody you feel like we ought to interview, feel free to okay. feel free to throw throw. Well, I, would, I would probably put that guy on the list because he wants to create a kudzu free zone. <laughs> So there's somebody else from District 2 that we needed to look at to see whether we... See yeah, all the same have any uh, nominations. Yeah, Samuel Mason, let me... Samuel Mason, what number is he? He's number one. Is he? Yeah, he's, not, he's, he's in District 2. He's not in 2. Well, you got, how many you got from District 2? We have two. Um, no, we have three. We have three. We have three. Jay Fine. Are you, are you, he's not currently on the list. Are you suggesting putting him on the list? I'm fine with that. Yeah, I okay. Jay Fine. Okay. So we're now at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We're at twelve. Um, we have a sufficient number from each district. From one and three, we have additional members. Um, some of these could end up in district two. I think some of these threes could end up in two. You know, for the just to for the sake of you know uh, decision making on this, my suggestion is that for this initial round. We are working under the assumption that the districts are the districts as they exist today, right? Like in the in the future, you know, when reappointments are happening years in the future, I think we'll want to keep the keep the policy of 
and, and we may need to, we'll, you know, we'll just, just like elections, like the elections will be different in the future, but for now I think we should just keep it based on the lines that exist today, otherwise this could get really messy. Um, anybody else? If there's anybody else that someone really, and we can wait, we can see who Commissioner Fryer wants to suggest, if he has one or two, then we're probably in the right neighborhood of uh, interviewees, and we can always interview more. Um, Josh, do you have anything to add? No, I was looking at the list. I think you, you covered one of the ones I should ask by staff to get to. If y'all will look at it, look at his uh, resume, you'll you'll want him on the list too. Okay. All right. We could end up. He's another district one. Yeah. He's. Uh, yeah. Uh, first, all right. Well, very good. Uh, uh, I'm 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 your one is. Which I think it's going to be in district two now. Uh, Turn your mic on, Robert. Let's no, let no. Lester's one. Uh, that's another district. Allie Howell District. He lives in Lester. That's the current District 3. But that, again, that, we're going to keep with the existing district. But do you, you feel you want him on the list? Okay, Allie Howell. I miss Mason in my pass through. He definitely needs to be on that interview list. Mason. Okay, I got him down. I got him. Jason Samuel Mason. Yeah, he's, yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's let's stop. And um, we have a lot. This will be um, now how how much time do we wanna spend with these interviews? Let's see how Uh, I think it should be, unfortunately, we'll take the 10 seconds. I think it's just with the volume you have of this, I think you have to move pretty quickly. So I'd suggest 10 minutes, and um, I can't do an introduction. Um, I'm, that's where I'm at. Let's, what do y'all think? I'm at 15 minutes, in fairness to them. I'm going to do 10 minutes. And you need a you need a minute or two to transition between yeah. people. It's going to end up being three hours of interviews. Yeah. Even at ten minutes, much. Okay. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. All right. Anything else people want to suggest uh, on this for now? I think we've done what we needed to do. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Now we move on to. Um, Yes, ma Chairman, do y'all have a time frame when y'all want to do these interviews? That's a good idea. Um, We're not doing anything until after the first year. I, I would just like to let these applicants know that their consideration for the first meeting of the year is on Tuesday the 7th. We also have an affordable housing committee that day, and there might be a pre meeting that day too. Um, I would suggest we not do it on that day because it's just going to be too much. Um, I think we should probably call a special meeting sometime in the first two weeks of the year. Yeah. So if we could just not figure that out right on the spot, but Lamar, if we could do check in and let's just find a date to come over in. Um, I'd probably prefer afternoon just myself rather than morning. All right. Now we come to Rachel Nygaard. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am here to update you about strategic partnership grants, and there are two pieces. One of them is about appointing the new committee. So in light of the conversation that you're having related to the Parks Committee, it's um, something to, that we'll, we'll want to talk through regarding the process for selecting those appointments. To begin, wanted to update you about the strategic partnership grant process. You should have a copy of the grant guidelines and your materials for today's meeting. The grant process officially opened on Monday of this week, so December 16th. Um, the information is posted online for members of the public and uh, people associated with community organizations. They can go to buncombecounty.org slash grants 
and review these grant guidelines, which were created based on the guidance and criteria that we got from the Board of Commissioners for this grant program. Those grant guidelines include thorough information about the eligibility timeline, grant application process, grant writing workshop, etc. There is one item related to the eligibility criteria that we want to come back in and check in with you about, and that is the type of organization. When the Board of Commissioners established the criteria for this grant program, we made it um, so that nonprofit organizations would be eligible to apply for funding. The question is, would we like for public organizations to also be eligible to apply? I know that there's been some conversation between members of the board and with the manager about potential eligibility for a governmental organization to be able to make application to Buncombe County for funding for a community project through this avenue. If, if the board would like to take that up for consideration, we can bring a, a marked up version of those grant guidelines on the agenda for your next regular meeting, which would be January 7th, to vote on. Which would just simply say that public agencies are also eligible. They would. Okay. And which could be, okay. they would essentially have, I was thinking of the timeline, the, the um, grant applications are due in mid-February, on February 14th. So uh, those public organizations would have uh, okay. roughly a month or five weeks to, to get that application in. Is there interest in putting that on your agenda for January 7th? Well, maybe just to kind of like, you know, first blush, you might kind of think, you know, that doesn't seem like what this is about, but um, just as a reminder of what we currently do, right, and maybe some of the rationale behind that, so we think about that before maybe um, making a decision. Currently, um, <clears throat> currently we fund, it's a small amount of money, we fund the HRC, right, because that is a jointly appointed board by the city council and the county commission, and the scope of that board is countywide. There's probably more things they deal with in the city, but they do have a countywide mission, that's my understanding. That's accurate. That's the Historic Resources Commission. Resources There's $4,500, I think, in the Strategic Partnership Grants right. currently that goes to the city of Asheville for that city-county work. The rationale being that, you know, shouldn't fall solely on the city. This is something we do together. So that's the rationale for that. And then on the um, on the um, nature center, you know, the, the city used to charge a lower rate. Like this is a subsidized operation, right? Like it costs the city half a million dollars a year, whatever the current amount is, to run the nature center. So since they put a lot of taxpayer money from their jurisdiction into it, they gave a discounted rate to city residents to attend. But then I think some commissioners were like, well, how come it costs more for county residents to go than the city? And so I think the city said, well, you know, are we all concluded? Well, it's, if, if they are putting in way more money, if we want the county residents to have the same low rate, we ought to put in the funds to make up that difference to make the city whole. So I don't know, I kind of feel like these different places where we work together, um, they each have their own rationale. It kind of feels different to me than the rationale that go into the strategic partnerships grant pool. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, just sort of thinking out loud here, but I wonder if maybe we should pull them out, but but just sort of in a separate decision process, decide if we, you know, we want to continue uh, those partnerships with the other public agencies or, or not. But I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. I personally would like to see those continue myself. So I'm gonna jump jump on the nature center and I'll be playing on, you know, everybody in my neighborhood goes to the nature center and uh, taxpayers from all over the county go to the nature center. I don't know where you put it in, but to me that that's one of the things that's been confusing about this is that you know I, I don't want to lose the ad advocacy for some of these you know destinations or some of these uh, things that we find whether the city funds or we fund them I mean, people in the city pay county taxes and, uh, and there's some things that make sense for us to do together. Nature Center is one of them. We lost a health adventure. No way we need to lose this one. Uh, Nature Center is a, is a good place for folks to go. So I don't know where it, yeah, where, where it lands, but it needs to, 
find some more time, Andrew. You got any thoughts on? Before you continue, I'd like to jump in and just add one clarification um, with permission. The Friends of the WNC Nature Center is a nonprofit organization. That funding is provided through a nonprofit organization, and they are still eligible to apply as currently structured. Please continue. The items that we were talking about that would require that the government entities are eligible to apply more like the CALA, the youth leadership that we do directly fund to the city of Asheville, or even to some of the county schools. Like there's funding that we're specifically going to government entities, not the nature center or, or the historic commission like that. But those are the items, those are nonprofits. The items that we were looking at was direct funding that we provide to the city of Asheville. And the one that comes to mind was the CALA, the Youth Leadership Academy that we fund. When we funded the Nature Center in the past to make up for the, uh, you know, the uh, charging city residents less than county residents, did that go to the Friends Group or to the city? Yes, to the Friends of the Nature Center. And then they passed it on to the, well, whatever. We don't really care how they did it, but it, it fixed the, the problem, right? Okay. The county residents being charged to be different. I mean, is it, is it the best way to, to deliver that money to the Friends of Nature Center or for that to, to go somewhere else? I just thought we had to fund that. We haven't thought of a with the city on that. That was, true. It was truly to the Nature Center. And that was our direct support to the Nature Center. So that wasn't one that we were talking about here in the government entities. Okay. You're going to live. I love it. What are we talking about? Why don't we, here's my suggestion. Why don't, we, why don't we amend the process so that public agencies can apply? So we're not precluding the possibility. And. Um, We'll, we'll let the process unfold. If, if some of the things that, you know, and again, I think this might be part of the outcome though, just this whole new way of doing it. I mean, some things might fall out of this funding process and we might then as a board have to say, are we okay with that? Or are we gonna step in and separately decide to fund some things that are not gonna get funded uh, otherwise? So, because I do feel like some of these, some of these things, like, like this particular issue, like, it, I, it's hard to imagine, like the rationale we had for funding this is not the same criteria we're giving this group to choose how to program these funds, right? So I feel like it's it's unlikely that we could fund it through our new process, but it should be. But we might need to find a different way to do it if it doesn't. So we, you know, my concern with having, you know, the committee and, you know, there's certain things that, you know, it's my job to represent the whole county now and to advocate for things that I hear. And so I just want to make sure that's not lost. And this is a great example of you know, the nature system make sure that that's not lost in the process. So, I think we're saying the same thing. Amanda, Al, Robert, Jacqueline, do you have any thoughts? I support it. I do as well. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So we'll bring um, a, an amended, proposed amended version for a vote at your next meeting. That'll be the only, we just need to make sure, uh, I think you know, Mr. Frew, I, I commented in an email, to make sure that if we're amending anything that we we have that's already in place, that when it comes to us, that it's got strike lines in it and red print, because it's impossible for me to determine what it was before. I mean, I, and I, I can't remember what it was I emailed them, but it's, maybe it's gonna be something. Maybe something we're looking at tonight. But if it, if it is, no pressure. But anyway. All right. Got it. Yep, that's that's good on the on the um, eligibility item. Now we have the committee. Um, <coughs> we took applications for the strategic partnership grant committee for a three week period and received twenty one applications. Those applications um, are being compiled by staff currently. We reached out to the applicants um, in the first couple of days this week, gathering some additional info from them and clarifying around connection to nonprofit organizations um, so that we make sure that we have full and complete information about um, their background and their expertise when we bring this to you. And so I guess the question to the board is, would you like to use the same process for determining uh, members that you'll appoint to this committee as you have just done with the committee discussion that you just held. <coughs> Could you just walk us through sort of the timeline you envision about when that committee? 
So the last bullet, the last bullet on the page uh, on the screen that you're looking at, maybe the one that's confusing you because it's <coughs> not, it says committee appointments scheduled for January 7th. That's when the staff was thinking that we might bring a recommended slate uh, for the board to consider. Um, it sounds like the board would like to, on a one by one basis, um, select and interview candidates. We will have some categories um, assigned to the applicants. So we've asked them to share with us what expertise they bring, say, in the, in the category of environmental stewardship versus educate, educated and capable community. So there will be some, um, some natural categories that show themselves as well as um, age and zip code and attributes um, in addition to the narrative answers to the questions about what they bring to the board. But um, what we'll do is organize that information for you, present it, um, and then in terms of timeline, we would like to have the committee seated no later than when the applications close on February 14th. It would be ideal to have them selected prior so that we can do some orientation before they begin uh, reviewing the applications. So you have 21 applications right now? Yes. I mean, I would like to see 21 applications, just like we did here. Great. So that, I mean, I know sometimes you can categorize people by experience on some of these, but some of that might know the most about what we're looking for <laughs> might just be a single mom of three, you know, so. Great. Well, we're completing that information um, right now. Um, it should be ready within the next day or two. Um, and so we'll use the uh, clerk to convey that information to you and follow your lead. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. All right, last item is the Catholic Charities School. Chair, board, and members. I have that on the place. It's a lot like this. But I received a request from Catholic Charities regarding the future of refugee resettlement program here in the county. In September, President Trump issued an executive order which requires written consent by the county and the state consenting or permitted for refugees to resettle in our, in our county. Catholic Charities shared with me that only refugees that have a link or family in the county are resettled here. But the question before you today is to discuss whether or not you would consider signing a consent to allow refugees to resettle here. I do have Ms. Sandra Buck in the audience with us. She's from the diocese, and she's here that she can assist in answering any questions you have about resettlement, the resettlement program. Thank you, Ms. Pender. And um, I'd invite you if you would just, just maybe share a few thoughts with us about this. This is, uh, this is not a process that local governments in the past have, this is a, have been invited to have input on. So a just, it's kind procedure. of a new... So you've never had to do it before because right. it's a brand new procedure. So yeah. we've been resettling refugees uh, for about 40 years. Um, I'm based out of Charlotte, but um, people have been coming here. Actually, I think it was... Uh, World Relief that used to resettle refugees here years ago. And we have an office in Asheville, and so we've got a case coordinator there who is actually a former refugee from Russia who works with these families. And we now have a remote placement program where we actually resettle directly into the Asheville area. Uh, we've resettled about 300 refugees here in the last three years. Uh, the majority of them are placed in Montgomery County because they're coming here to join their family that already lives here. Um, the, the consent process is brand new, um, and what we're required to do is get the governor and the chief executive officer of every county where we place refugees to sign a consent saying that it's okay to continue doing that. Thank you so much. And so uh, uh, we have a draft letter. You can see the good letter the governor signed is in here, so we could sign a similar letter. And um, I'm certainly happy to do so, or have the county manager do it. One of us do it, but it's we wanted the commission to, you know, be aware of this and to uh, concur. I have a question. Where are these refugees from? Uh, the refugees that are coming to the Asheville area are from Russia, Ukraine, and Moldova. None from any third world countries? 
No, just those three places. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's because they're coming to family, and their families already live here. So we're not just bringing folks that will be on social services, so to speak. They're coming to families. Is, is that a requirement that there be family here? Turn your mic on. Uh, that's not a requirement. That just happens to be how the refugees are coming into Asheville. Um, when they, as soon as they arrive, they can petition to bring their family members that they left behind. That process takes a couple of years, um, but once they're approved to travel, then they will typically resettle with their what we call their U.S. tie or their anchor family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would too. Yes, it is. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. And they're well supported. A lot of them come and they start their own businesses. Oh, yeah. They, you know, they employ their family members immediately. Uh, and the other thing to note is, once refugees arrive in the United States, they are free to travel wherever they wish. So any counties that don't consent will still end up receiving refugees just as secondary migrants. It's just a lot harder for us to provide the services if we're not if they're not in the county with their family. Well, thank you for the work that y'all do. Is there a time limit by which we need to make the decisions? My national has requested consent by the end of the year. Um, the deadline's been pushed back by the State Department, but the uh, nine national organizations that resettle refugees are all submitting their proposals for next year at, the, at in, sometime in the middle of January and are hoping to be able to report with their proposal how many consents they've received. Uh, well, thank you, for the, um, thank you for the information. It sounds like we should schedule this for commission vote at the first meeting uh, in January, which is on January, the, um, January 7th, first Tuesday of the month. So we'll plan on having it on the agenda to make a, make a decision that evening. Um, and if commissioners have any other questions, or if there's additional information that can be provided to us, uh, please send that. Feel free along. to reach out to me. I can answer whatever questions that you have. Okay, great. Um, commissioners, any other questions for now? But because it does sound like we need to make a decision at that meeting, if you do have additional questions, please do bring them to the county manager, and we'll work we'll work with the organization to make sure you get any information you need between now and then. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate Thanks it. for having me. All right, that's everything we had on our agenda. So if there's no other items, I think we're adjourned. We'll be back at 5 o'clock for the rest of the week.